I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy, to the environment, to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in. According to 2008 data just published by the Centers for Disease Control, cancers of the lung, breast, and prostate result in more deaths in the United States than any other form of that dreaded disease. Medical advances attacking these cancers have recently made breakthroughs that bring hope for accurate diagnoses and treatments that can extend the lives of ourselves and those we love. Joining us today to talk about these innovations and more are radiation oncologist Dr. Roger Gilbert and Dr. Jonathan Breslau, President of Radiological Associates. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Scott. So what is it about cancer that makes it so difficult to treat and to identify? Well, what makes it so difficult to treat is that cancer cells, to a great degree, are our cells. So that a lot of the processes that keep these cells going are the same ones that operate our own normal tissues. Mm -hmm. So that, that targeting them in a way that doesn't damage normal tissue is a real challenge. And that's where we're, we're moving in these days. And, and so in being able to target them more accurately and to be able to make sure that we're taking care of getting rid of that cancer but doing it in a way that's as safe as possible and diminishes quality of life as little as possible, where, where are the leaps forward? What's happening? Well, in uh, terms of the, the imaging side, uh, the most important thing is the early detection. So things are as small as possible. The smaller they are, the harder it's, it is to tell if they're different than the normal tissue, of course. So that's a limitation. And the uh, technologies that we use, particularly in breast cancer, looking using uh, mammography, involve radiation. So we need to minimize the amount of radiation we use yet still have a diagnostic image that's effective in finding what we're looking for. Um, and that needle in the haystack issue, I, I know that, for instance, in prostate cancer, for instance, um, you all are able to, there have been advances in being able to precisely target where it is that, that treatment is going to. But there's some sort of, of new technology or breakthrough that allows you to essentially light a person up to find out where things are active that you couldn't see before. What, what is that? Well, positron emission tomography or PET scanning mm -hmm. uh, was developed uh, quite a few years ago originally for a different purpose, but it turned out that, it, that this radioactive sugar molecule that you inject into sugar. patients, it's a radioactive sugar. sugar. Okay. Cancer cells uh, use sugar as their source of energy, mm -hmm. and this special form of radioactive sugar becomes trapped in the cells and it emits radiation that's picked up by a detector. So you get a picture of the patient with bright spots indicating areas of, of high sugar metabolism. And how is that different from before? Well, the difference between scanning patients to look at the anatomy of the patient, in mm -hmm. other words, the shape of things in their body, is mm -hmm. different from functional scanning, which, mm -hmm. is, which is actually looking at what's going on inside the cells that you're imaging. Okay. And in doing that, this allows what for the situation where it is that where the physician comes to you and says well we think we got it and then six months later well unfortunately we didn't to be decreased yes and and going back one step further to find things earlier before even the diagnosis is made that it's a smaller thing so again on purely anatomic basis there may be something that's very tiny that you can't separate from the normal tissue but on a PET scan and now merging the information the PET data with the CT so you get both the functional and the anatomic information superimposed on one another you can see very quickly this tissue on purely CT looks normal but the PET there's a little spot here that's lighting up and we got to see what that is. So it allows to start earlier in the, in the normal progression of the cancer that you find something earlier, lower stage, higher survivability. Once the patient has the diagnosis and is under treatment, then yes, exactly what you said, you can see after they've had treatment, radiation or surgery or chemotherapy or a combination, what's left, if anything, 
and then if something starts to come back, you can pick that up earlier. Also, you can tell earlier in the course of treatment if the treatment's working or mm -hmm. if it's not working because the progression is very closely monitored with the PET information. Okay, so of these innovations, what the people at home really are gonna wanna know is this, how is this gonna make a difference for me or my loved ones if we're confronting a potential cancer well, issue? Well, I guess you know to, to use PET scanning as a jumping sure. off point, uh, one of the really important features of this is it's allowed us to select who are the appropriate patients to treat really aggressively, say with radical surgery. You know, years before, we had a lower probability of being able to detect this early spread of the cancer. It doesn't make any sense to remove someone's lung if there are already nests of cancer in other parts of their body. And that's what PET scanning has allowed us to do, is detect those little nests of cancer earlier and spare patients from a radical operation that will not benefit them. So it's a, it's a great example of how something which is an expensive test can save a lot of money and grief down the line by preventing you know, futile treatment. So once we've got someone appropriately staged, and stage means determine how extensive their tumor is, mm -hmm. you wanna choose the, the most appropriate treatment. And, and here's where I think just being in a community like Sacramento where you have good specialists throughout the oncology uh, spectrum that collaborate with each other and discuss cases at tumor boards really helps you to feel some assurance that you're going to get the appropriate treatment or be given the appropriate options, which is so much what we do well, now. Well, uh, let's talk about that for a second because when you talk about appropriate options and appropriate treatment, here's the fear of patients. The fear of patients is, is that our clinicians either aren't talking to each other or, and aren't presenting us with all the options or what they're doing is they may be aware of the options, but because of a, of a dictate from either a health plan provider or some other uh, cost containment administrator, they're not gonna get access to those treatments, and so they may not even be told about it. And that, for, for us, could be the difference between life and death. How do we deal with that? Well, what I've seen is that patients are becoming much more well-informed about just this issue. I frequently have patients ask me, is there anyone else I should see to discuss this problem? Or uh, you know, what are my other options for treating this? And a lot of the, the, the access of uh, information patients have on the internet or in printed material emphasize that there are options. And I think that when you're in a, in a large community like this where there are tumor boards, I mean, patients should feel empowered to say to their physician, are you gonna present my case to a tumor board, for example? And uh, who else did you discuss this T case tell with? Tell us, okay, tell us this. Okay, because for, for me, that's a foreign language. For me to go to my physician and say, are you going to present this to your tumor board? Tell us what a tumor board is and why that's relevant. Well, a tumor board is a, is a, is a conference, an educational conference that, it, at least in my hospital, occurs once a week in which cases which are challenging and uh, you know, present you know, more than the average amount of uh, decision making are presented. In other words, the doctor who's initially caring for the patient will describe the case, we'll look at the actual tumor material under the microscope in front of, the, in front of this whole group. We have these wonderful color projectors. We'll look at the imaging studies, the scans, and then it's like a round table discussion. It's like we're having here, except more mm -hmm. people, discussing what the options are, the pros and the cons. People will discuss what the literature has shown. And uh, it's an educational process for the doctor who's ultimately caring for the patient, and then that filters down to better care for the patient. And Scott, I just wanted to add that I think uh, to the patients and their family members, um, try to find out what you can, look up information you can, you can get, do your research, and you're not going to really expect it to just make the decision by yourself, but come prepared to the doctor and ask them the questions and get all your questions answered before treatment course is started. Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk a little bit more about some of the really exciting innovations that are taking place. Now, you brought a, a couple of things with you, and I, this uh, mask looks like something that um, you'd be taking to a Halloween party uh, sometime in the future. Can you tell us what this is and, and what, what is this all about? Well, I brought this in as, as just an example of how one of the ways that we're reducing the side effects of radiation and improving our ability to cure cancers is to be more precise in targeting the tumor and minimizing how much normal tissue we radiate because radiation affects normal tissues as well as cancer. It's just that cancer doesn't repair radiation damage as well, so that's why we preferentially can kill the cancers. So in patients who have tumors in the head and neck region, 
Uh, simply assuring that their position is exactly the same every day allows us to reduce the margin of safety around that tumor and reduce the side effects. And how does, it, how does that impact if, if I suffered from this form of cancer, the fact that um, my r treatment was being more precisely targeted, how will that affect me on a day-to-day -day basis? Here's a great example. When we treat certain types of throat cancers, you know, one of the classical side effects of that is the dryness of the mouth that was caused by damage to the salivary glands. Well, now we're able to mark exactly where those salivary glands are on a CAT scan and by using very sophisticated treatment planning called intensity modulated radiation therapy, we can actually sculpt the radiation field to avoid the salivary glands and preserve their function and still treat the, the target, the tumor, to exactly the same high dose that we always wanted to do. But in order to do that, we have to really be sure the patient is in exactly the same position every day. And these masks are one of the ways we do that, in addition to what's called image guidance, mm -hmm. which we can talk about more if you'd like. All right, well, actually, what I and many of the males uh, watching this show are gonna be most interested in is uh, what's going on with prostate cancer. And um, this right here looks like a security device or, or something, a high-tech chip from a movie. What is this? This is a Calypso beacon. Mm -hmm. So this, this uh, little device, which is no, no bigger than a grain of rice, three of these are implanted into the prostate gland by a urologist mm -hmm. prior to their radiation treatment. And what this allows us to do is monitor the position of the prostate gland within the patient's body on a second-by-second -second basis while the radiation beam is on. And typically patients are having their radiation over a period of 15 or 20 minutes up to. And although we can set a patient up very precisely prior to that treatment, mm -hmm. this allows us to actually monitor the location of the prostate from second to second. Because things like a bubble of gas passing through the GI tract can actually move the prostate. Our therapists can actually watch a moving graph of three dimensions of movement and stop the radiation if the target moves out of the field. Hmm, that's interesting. Fascinating. Well, you know, when, when I hear about these technologies, it always comes back to the debate that goes on nationally about cost, okay? So all of this expensive technology, and let's take for a moment, yes, there's an improvement mm -hmm. in terms of quality of life or a slight leap forward in terms of the efficacy of the treatment in terms of extending life. But at what cost to society? Uh, you know, healthcare, it was said by a futurist in healthcare that healthcare is the one sector of the economy where advances in technology don't actually lower cost. How do you respond to that? Well, uh, there's several different parts uh, to that discussion. Uh, first of all, in, in this country so far, we haven't really uh, tried to make um, uh, trade-offs. We really haven't done trade-offs in healthcare, and if something improves uh, lifespan, we've just used it. Um, that's one thing. Uh, but also, the individual treatments, and for example, uh, being able to do a, a short course of radiation treatment is has a cost, but if you look at that whole patient, if they didn't have that treatment, there would be a bunch of other things that happened, maybe surgeries, maybe more surgeries, maybe more complications, all of which add to the cost. So the new technology may have a cost, but not having it may have a bigger cost. So we may actually be, in terms of the treatment of that disease, the whole cost may be going down. Well, I want to follow up on, on your comment a, a few moments ago about making trade-offs yes. in terms of, of new technologies and treatments and we just do what's necessary. That almost invites a, a discussion, in fact it does invite a discussion, <laughs> right. of uh, the comment by Sarah Palin and others about death panels right. as a result of the uh, Health Care Act. How do you respond to this whole notion that we're going to have to make these trade-offs in order to bend this cost curve that we hear about so much? Well, you know, to tell you the truth, at RAS, we've, we've made some of these decisions all along the way. I mean, there, we do not purchase every new technology that comes down the line. For example, proton therapy uh, is, a, is a very expensive form of radiation therapy. A proton machine costs probably at least 10 times what a linear accelerator costs, and a linear accelerator costs $4 million. I wish I knew what those things were. Uh, uh, well, pro so, protons mm -hmm. is, is you, instead of using high-energy x-rays, it's mm -hmm. using tiny little particles of radiation. And there are a few centers which do this in the United States. And that's used for what? It's used for pretty much any cancer, although its original 
more, more specific use was in, in childhood cancers where you wanted to confine the radiation as much as possible to a very small area. But actually, most of the people who get treated with protons have prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And we've looked at the data, and it's clear to us that there's no evidence that all that additional cost is justified in any better results. And so even though you, know, you could choose to buy equipment like that for marketing purposes, uh, in terms of quality of treatment, it doesn't improve the situation, and it's very expensive, and someone ends, ends up having to pay for it. Sure. Yeah, so those are trade-offs we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to make. Um, but go ahead. You, you asked a question about death panels. Um, there's parts of the discussion that uh, have not been, shall we say, reality-based entirely, and I think that the the, tr the concept, the terminology that was chosen there, uh, the death panels, was not meant to further the discussion of how do we provide health care to Americans at the, the best of health care at the lowest cost. It's, it was a political game. A On the other a hand... A political game. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Now, you supported the Health Care Act, yes. right? Yes, yes. So, with so many opponents, now it's been decided by the Supreme Court now, but, but it begs the question, what is it in you supporting the Health Care Act as a physician, as the president of a large medical institution and provider yes. of health care services, what is it that you know that the opponents, which number in the thousands, or didn't millions. know, or millions, either didn't know or refused to acknowledge that led to you supporting this pretty controversial piece of legislation? Well, uh, there's some very large macroeconomic things, which is that the cost of health care continues to skyrocket in this country, and at some point it will be unaffordable. It will eat our economy. So that's, that's one thing that is a fact. That's, that's like gravity. That's just there. And to not address that, I think, is irresponsible. Um, so that's the first step, which is the Affordable Care Act was attempting to address that. And then the next step is they used, uh, as best as they could tell, real mathematics to say, we're going to spend this much and we're going to save this much, and the cost is going to, the rise of the cost is going to slow down. But when an they image, say, but when, image, oh, go ahead, yeah. but when they say, though, that they're going to bring the cost down by advancing this or doing less of that, that sounds a lot like what's known as cookbook medicine, where it is that every patient that comes in is treated the same. And for as long as I can remember, it's always been said that medicine and the treatment of, of humans is both art and science. It sounds like we're saying that the art is out the window and that every diagnosis is the same and every patient is the same. I think, uh, the, I think the art and the science are getting into better balance. And although I don't like the term uh, cookbook medicine, what I do like is evidence-based medicine. This is making decisions based on published data that is more than just your hunch or your personal preference. And you know, an example in, in treating breast cancer, for example, is uh, many, many years back, it, it began to look clear that the combination of a lumpectomy and radiation was just as effective as removing the breast or a mastectomy for treating early breast cancer. Yet it took you know, multiple studies in which women, bless their souls, volunteered to let a coin toss determine which of those two treatments they had and then following those patients for 5, 10, 15, 20 years to ultimately prove right. that there was no difference between those two approaches. And that's what evidence-based medicine is all about. It's expensive to do those studies. Uh, and that's one of the concerns we have about the reduced you know, funding for medical research from the government is that these studies yeah. have to be done to help people down the line. But it, it, when you talk about evidence-based medicine, yeah. that sounds like that the decision for how it is that uh, a loved one is going to receive treatment is purely mechanical in nature. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it does, it does sound like that, but it's not exactly, you have to look at the whole spectrum of all health care, and there are different types of things that are more appropriate for quote-unquote rule-based versus really need to be very, very individually tailored. So a patient who has a known diagnosis of hypertension, which is many, many, many patients, how their follow during the course of that disease and the, how the complications are minimized can appropriately be very rule-based. That's fine. And same with the surveillance and monitoring of diabetes, for example. 
And just those two diagnoses involve millions of Americans. And to make that be very structured is totally appropriate. Whereas someone who comes in with an unknown diagnosis um, and has had, you know, a 60-year-old man who's had uh, memory problems or something like that, and it needs still a physician to think it over and scratch their head and do a series of tests and follow the patient and so on. So that wouldn't be something that would be appropriately strictly rule-based. Um, and then in cancer, um, to have the range of treatments and where each patient uh, once their diagnosis is made and the exact extent of their disease is determined as best as can be, to have each patient get what is really the best treatment for them is something that is 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 partly uh, appropriately ruled. Well, let's uh, let's talk about that because there's an emerging field called pharmacokinetics, pharmacogenetics, pharmacogenetics, yeah. which is almost like creating a Birkenstock treatment plan or, or treatment protocol for a patient. But that would seem to fly in the face of evidence-based medicine. Well, it's... it's because a, it's so individualistic, you know, right? My not very good analogy was there's a much bigger cookbook now. Right. Is that, you know, what right. we're hoping to do is to individualize treatment based upon something you can actually measure. And what we're finding now is that cancer cells, some of them have very specific little targets on the surface of them, which can be attacked using drugs which have very little side effects to normal tissue. And those drugs, sometimes in combination with things like radiation and surgery, can make a real difference. And in order to determine who's a candidate for what kind of treatment, you do have to do some additional testing. Now, is any of this going on right now where there's a... There's oh. a Absolutely, yes. absolutely. I mean, in, in breast cancer, about one out of five women with breast cancer have too many copies of a gene called the HER2 gene. And we now routinely test for that. And if they have one of those cancers, they get a huge benefit from one of these drugs called Herceptin, which is an antibody that attacks that receptor. Uh, in, in, in lung and, and uh, melanoma, uh, we're finding there are specific genetic um, markers that can make tumors particularly sensitive to some of these new, what are called targeted agents. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we, we're learning so much more about cancer that rather than just saying, you know, everyone needs this radical operation or everyone needs to get chemotherapy, that's falling by the wayside. That's what I called sort of cookbook medicine. Ah. You know, this stage of cancer mm -hmm. needs this form of treatment. It's mm -hmm. much more complicated than that mm -hmm. now. So what, what innovations are on the horizon, gentlemen, that you think will be coming up sooner rather than later that you think are really going to make an impact on the lives of the people watching the show. Well, I think one of the things that we've that we're working on, you know, really a lot at RAS now is called uh, stereotactic uh, body radiotherapy, which is a very long way of saying extremely focused targeted radiation on small targets using very high doses over very short periods of time to have a high probability of ablating small tumors. Most classically, we use it in small lung cancers in patients who unfortunately have, have such damaged lungs that they can't have surgery. Quick interruption, sure. ablating, what does that mean? Destroying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, really de really destroying. destroying. Uh, you know, relying less on the differential ability of radiation to kill cancer versus normal tissue. We're using doses that are so high that, that nothing survives that. Mm -hmm. But it's focused so tightly on the tumor that we're seeing, you know, 90% or so control rates. And these are patients who otherwise really didn't have any options because they couldn't tolerate an operation. Right. So by doing this very sophisticated targeting, even now using these beacons right around the tumor so we can track the tumor as a person breathes, uh, is allowing us to, to treat people we never could treat even five years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to mention that that's another example where a technology that has a cost is reducing the total cost of, of, that, patient's, of that patient's care. Uh, the treatment is shorter. Uh, the impact on that patient's life is less because they don't have to come back and forth as many times and other additional treatments they may not have and other additional uh, side effects uh, it's particularly in people with compromised lung function to begin with who can't tolerate them all those things would be reduced so again a new technology that costs money but the total cost is down and people are going to live better I mean less of an impact on being able to go about their day-to-day -day lives. so, yes. Oh, and, and my personal experience in having treated quite a number of these folks is that during the treatment, there's virtually no sensation they have at all. Mm -hmm. And instead of coming in for 35 treatments, they come in for five treatments. Wow. Yeah. So, that is a reduction. Yeah, so it's, it's a huge reduction in it. In so, so time. quick question uh, as we're coming to the end of our time together. 
20 years from now, be, a, be futurist for a second, in 20 years from now, looking back, what do you think is happening in 2012 that 20 years from now we'll say, man, that was the beginning of a real revolution that made a difference for the, for the patients we see, we see and for the community that we're in? I think it's the personalized medicine, the targeted therapies. It's, it's being able to look at cancer as not just this is lung cancer. We're going to be able to look at it and, and be able to categorize it in a way that helps us treat patients in a less toxic manner. Mm. And Dr. Breslau, you get the final word. Well, I think that, go back to the Affordable Care Act, that in 2012, well, 2010 through 2014, actually, between the act passing and the act really fully being implemented, that we finally started to deal with the cost of health care and how to provide better value at lower cost. All right. Thank you both. Uh, this was extremely informative and very hopeful for folks and folks who have loved ones that are suffering from these types of conditions. Well, thank you, Scott. All right. Good luck Thanks, in your Scott. work. Thank you. Well, that's our show. And thanks to our guests, and thanks to you for watching. For Studio Sacramento, I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy to the environment to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in.